but I don't I really don't have any regrets I really don't I've I've lived exactly how I've wanted to I've tried my hardest every single time I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won or but I really gave it my all so that for me is enough It's me. Hi. Where the body serve? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Delete it. It is Run staying. Run that back. It is staying. <laughs> you got a song that was undesirable to you, stuck in your head, won't say which one, and I said, fine, I'll fix it. And I knew. I knew you were going to fix it with that. <laughs> uh, so, do you feel properly gaslit after this Australian <laughs> Open? I do. Yeah, I've totally forgotten what happened last year and rearranged the facts in my brain. It's such a great case study to explain to people what gaslighting is this entire <laughs> month. <laughs> now, the word gaslighting is overused, definitely. Uh, but I, yes, I felt that my reality was shooketh a little bit mm -hmm. because I, I, I can even go back to the agenda, which I have done and gone through like the timeline and the facts and the cast of characters and nobody really seems to remember. It's not just that history was erased. History was rewritten. Yes, and I fear it will stay that way. Anywho, <laughs> this is our Australian Open 2023 recap episode. When was the last time we recorded? It was the round of 16 stage? A week ago. Okay. Yep, so this will be uh, podcast number four of the Australian Open. Five on the season. We are a stone's throw away from the end of our GoFundMe campaign. Which I feel we've been saying for a long time. <laughs> but the Australian Open is over. We're gonna release the episode and then it'll be done very shortly after. Yeah. But well you said to me, well it's it's done today. I thought it was I thought it was And I said, done. well, that doesn't make any sense to release an episode and have people not have a chance. One last chance. Fair you know? enough. If you're a procrastinator, it will be open uh, while you're listening to this for a few days or so, and then it's done. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, if you've contributed 75 and above, please send us your address because we, we're going to get to work on that now. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to come visit your house. <laughs> just just kidding. Uh, we were well ahead of the game with that stuff last year. But, you know, COVID this year, it oh, really well, set, set us yes. back in a lot of ways for january <laughs> we have yeah we've not started doing the postcards but we no just sweat, no problem we will we just finished our christmas celebrations on saturday <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah let's get down to this australian open and shall we start with the women because that was more fun well it was fun period and thus more fun because there the was no fun right <laughs> for us <laughs> Arena Sabalenka, at long last, is a Grand Slam title holder. And it feels... In singles. What? In singles. What do you mean? She's won in doubles. Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> but this feels so right, mm -hmm. doesn't it? it? It feels like it, it's been bound to happen for a long time. It's given me some joy to see it happen. I would just like to say that on our preview episode, I pointed to the winner of Sabalenka Bencic as... The likely winner of this tournament. You did. You did. Mm -hmm. Abenchich would have never won, but it was still a good call. <laughs> it's not just that Sabalenka won this tournament. It's how she won this tournament. The quality of that final was absurd. Truly an insta-classic final. It was the first time that Sabalenka had dropped a set all tournament. All year. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Uh, and... Elena came in with such poise. Both players were oddly calm for the occasion. Rybakina had been through it before, of course, at Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. But Arena had suffered these three devastating semifinal losses and slams. And she just seemed like she walked into the final with something to prove. Like she, she was serene, even after losing the first set. Uh, to be clear, to my mind, Rybakina looked in complete control of this match after the first set. Which makes Sabalenka's comeback all the more impressive to me. Mm -hmm. Sabalenka just looked like she was holding on for dear life. <laughs> but at the start of the second set and into the middle of it, she, she was ahead. 
And at every turn where it looked like Rybakina could wrestle the momentum back away from her, she held firm. Like going for bold second serves, big first serves. Nothing was held back. I mean, this is a woman with so much scar tissue on a tennis court. Mm-hmm. Not just from the previous semifinal losses at, at slams, but from this time a year ago. Mm-hmm. She was underarming, underhanding serves a year ago because it was that bad. She had zero control and confidence in her serve a year ago. This was a stroke that had completely broken down. She saw a biomechanics specialist. She's seen a sports therapist. The therapist she no longer sees because now she feels like she's her own therapist, which maybe means it worked right? a little. Right. Like the, <laughs> One of the takeaways from that a lot of people got was, oh, well, she doesn't need it. It didn't work for her. She's going to do it herself. She's going to be her own therapist. Or maybe she just has tools now to be able to figure things out on her own. Mm-hmm. I, maybe she got some techniques while she was working with the therapist. Whatever she has done really worked. In this final, she served 17 aces to seven double faults. She hit 51 winners against 28 unforced errors in a three-set Grand Slam final against a player who is her equal, mostly, from the ground. Mm -hmm. And her superior on first serve. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. The other thing about this final that was crazy to me is that for... A lot of the back end of this match, Sabalenka was able to make Rybakina look like she was struggling to keep up with her from the baseline, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I still struggle to wrap my head around how she did that. There was one point where Sabalenka could only win the point by sheer brute force of her ground stroke, knocking Rybakina onto the ground. Literally fell back onto the ground at the baseline. There was no give or let up in either woman in this final. Elena is not known as the best mover on court, but I find the way that she hits, uh, it has like a certain grace to it. I like watching her. And Arena is obviously a powerful player as well, but they hit the ball in completely different ways. They move around the court in completely different ways. I never felt that... Oh, this is monotonous. Because you saw players of, in some ways, contrasting style who both play power baseline games. Mm -hmm. What was a bit monotonous was Sabalenka going to Rybakina's forehand Mm -hmm. to start her service game like five times in a row (laughs) and having Rybakina hit a winner or unreturned to go love 15 up. (laughs) Right. Which is not where you want to be, let's say, if you were serving second in the final set. I mean, the, the target for Sabalenka was clearly the Rybakina forehand. Mm-hmm. That's her weaker shot. But at a certain point, a pattern becomes predictable. Uh, the way, like, Arena plays a little bit differently than she used to. I feel like she's adding a little bit more arc, a little more percentage to get over the net. And, uh, you know, it really shows in the accuracy. I don't, I don't know how you hit that hard for that long and almost double your unforced errors with winners. And same with Rybakina was also on the the plus side of winners to unforced errors. There was a lot of talk by the commentariat during this match. Mm. It started with, oh, could this be one of the most powerful ground stroke matchups that you've ever seen? Well, you know, it could be. If not, it's right up there. And by the third set, it's like, well, this is definitely the most powerful... (laughs) display of ground stroke hitting in the history of the world (laughs) tennis tennis is just incapable of restraint yes and avoiding being swept up in this tornado of cliche because well show me the numbers that's what tennis is lacking in this in data right if why say oh i think maybe this could be the most powerful well show us some numbers clearly you don't have them well, in the absence of numbers, mm-hmm. we also live through Kim Clijsters, I mean, Lindsay Davenport, Venus versus Venus, Madison, probably Serena, Madison, a whole host of players yeah. who thrived in the Big Babe era. You know, this right. this was this was the manifestation of that era. This final, right? I, 
we often want the contrast. It's why people, part of the reason why a lot of people love the Fadal rivalry, right? There's such mm-hmm. a distinct visual contrast on court. This match was, it was big babe tennis, period. There's been so much talk about Arena's uh, mental fortitude over the past year to get over the serve. And of course, that's huge. But I don't want to downplay the actual hard work and toil it would take to break down and rebuild a stroke that's giving you trouble. Like it's actually just repetitions, hard physical labor trying to fix this thing in addition to the psychological pressure. Because we're often told that it's damn near impossible for a grown-ass tennis player who's been honing their skills since they were eight years old to completely rebuild one stroke in their arsenal in their 20s like that, and be successful at it. But here she's done it, for now at least. You know, yips are something that happens in sport all the time. Maybe they'll come back, but for now, it was a feat. Sabalenka is up to number two, or returns to number two in the world. And with that Daphne trophy, she created quite the stir with her photo shoot the day after. (laughs) Unironically, I absolutely love it. They're 10 out of 10, no notes, perfection. She's in the river, on this boat. There's a tiny little white dog in the back that I did not notice the first few times. She's wearing this form-fitting a long pink dress with kind of flower bunches all over it. And she's just having the time of her life. And allegedly, the Manolo Blahniks that Big proposed to carry with in Sex in the City. Oh no, that's not alleged. Somebody posted the photo from Sex in the City, and it is. I think the first movie? I don't remember when it happened. A lot of people don't like the dress. Fine. I'm not even sure I like the dress. I like what the shoot is giving. I've seen arena described as goofy a lot over the last two weeks and for me what that shoot was giving was goofy glamour <laughs> playful pinup silly siren oh, like <laughs> you have you thought about this or these were just off the cuff uh, just off the cuff you know i have i have oral talent uh, i have audio talent uh-huh like mm-hmm. o- o- oral oral talent do you mean like verbal a-U-R-A-L. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. Um, anyway, Arena just looked like she was having fun. A lot of times you don't get to feel the player's personality come out during these photo shoots. They feel so staged. But she was giving the sense that she was art directing that whole thing. That she was the stage manager. She was giving you leg. She was giving you all different angles. It, it looked like she was having the time of her life. And she was probably up all night, the previous night, eating pizza and getting drunk and crying. Uh, I just can't imagine the gigantic weight off her shoulders. The semifinals saw Rybakina beat Azarenka and Sabalenka beat Magda Lynette. Vika did amazingly well to get to the semifinals, beating Jesse Pegula, who had been surging and who had been beating players easily in straight sets. But Vika was not going to take down Rybakina in this form. I didn't think anybody was. Oh, well, I mean, Vika played exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. There were times when Vika looked completely overpowered, but she still clawed her way back into the match, especially in the first set. She was down a break and had a a real shot at winning that first set. But once that Mm -hmm. went away from her, so did the match. Her margins in beating somebody like Rybakina are a lot smaller than somebody like... Sabalenko. Yes. Kudos to Magda Lynette, who has the breakout result of her life at this tournament (laughs) and played exceptional tennis against Sabalenka even in the semifinals. She did not look like she was out of her depth in that match. And it was a similar story in that semifinal, right? A very tight first set that could have gone either way. And then the second set sort of worked itself out. The scores were nearly identical. 7-6-6-2 in one and then 7-6-6-3 in the other. And while they were both straight sets wins, they were both highly enjoyable to watch. And very competitive. Great showings by Donna Vekic getting to the quarterfinals and Karolina Pliskova, who is still out here contending for majors after so many people counted her out completely. 
Ostapenko made the quarterfinals. She's now back in Riga, where she's getting her nails done. The win over Coco Goff was impressive, but she ran into the Rybakina buzzsaw in the quarterfinals. Had Rybakina won this tournament, her path, the players that she would have left in her wake of destruction, would have been one of the more impressive runs that we've seen in recent times. Yes. Because mind you, she also took out Iga Sviantek. Mm-hmm. The moment that Sabalenka won this tournament, immediately commentators were wanting to to go the way of, well, how many can she win now? <laughs> the weight has been lifted off her shoulders. Is she just going to blitz through the WTA and by this time next year, she'd be going for her fifth in a row? Like, why? Who cares? And Iga Sviantek has been number one by like double the points for a long time now. Uh, We're just looking for somebody who can challenge Iga at the top. Maybe a few people. Also, if you've been paying attention to the WTA at all over the last few years, you know that there are no fewer than 20 people who can win any given slam, except for maybe Iga at the French. The women's tournament was was a saving grace here. We'll talk a bit more about the women later in some etc. But uh, the men... I think our listeners deserve some honesty here. I think they come to us for a little authenticity. And I'm just going to say, like, I, I don't care at all. I should care because history is being made. Uh, records, all-time records are being tied. We're watching one of the goats compete at what looks to be an incredible peak, even if it's not his peak. But saying that, I, I don't care. Novak did what we expected him to do. He won his 10th title in Melbourne. He returns to world number one. According to John McEnroe, Novak probably felt that he had it taken away from him last year. And you'd be hard-pressed not to feel the same. I mean, this is the type of of discourse that we're getting on air during (laughs) this match. The whole thing is about what was done to him as opposed to what he did actually do to himself. Right. To be clear, there were many players here. There were many competing interests, including the incompetent Victoria State government, the incompetent Craig Tiley, the Morrison government who had a political reason to keep Novak out. Novak himself, who knew he didn't qualify to enter, was given bad information, came anyway, hubristically announced his impending arrival, got popped at the airport, could have left at any time, didn't, dragged out this ordeal for weeks. By his own evidence, may have exposed a group of children to COVID, if that's to be believed, or falsified documents. One of the two. The alternative is that he didn't have COVID. No two ways about it, Novak Djokovic is the best player at the Australian Open. I guess I can go even further and say he may be the best hardcourt player of all time. He's definitely the best hardcore player right now. That's a pretty solid yes, not just a maybe. Well, I mean, uh, how many U.S. Opens does he have? Oh, sure, sure, okay. I I think he's the best hardcore player of all time, but there are always these arguments, these things you can nitpick. But at the end of his career, I do believe he will be, bar none, the best hardcore player that's ever lived on the men's tour. Yeah, and let's be honest, he will be the GOAT. He's not even 36. He's 35 years old and playing at this level. None of these younger guys can touch him. Like, nobody was even close. Enzo Cuaco took a set from him, and a lot of better players did not. Got completely ran over. Craig Tiley did everything he could to set the table for this. Novak would have won anyway. Like, let's be serious. Novak was going to win this tournament. But Craig Tiley gave him all night matches. He was begging to be forgiven. And throughout the tournament, Novak was pissed off. Who was begging to be forgiven? Craig? Craig. Okay. Because Craig knows he was largely responsible for the fiasco that happened last year. You know, this was a this was a resentment tour. This was, you guys screwed me last year. You could have changed the course of my career, and I've overcome this. I win. I have the last lap. And I'm sure it was fun to watch for his fans, but it wasn't really fun to watch for anybody else. No, when he collapsed in his in his player box... I was disgusted. And like all the emotions that I was told I should be feeling, they were miles away. (laughs) 
And the language that was being used about this year and what happened last year was, oh, this is redemption. Uh, after all that happened to him, oh, it's all coming out now. Like, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's as if he wasn't a participant. Uh, Patrick McEnroe said, this is all that happened last year coming out right now in describing Novak's emotions in winning this tournament. Like, that is deeply lazy and unserious commentary. But it's a pretty par for the course for, for that guy. Some people will probably turn this off or whatever, but I simply cannot fake it, and I will not. What could have been a simple redemption tour, a quiet redemption tour, where he just came, did his thing, collected his trophy, and went home, turned into a a lot of vindictiveness. Yes, it was a lot of... Chip on the shoulder. Only my injuries are questioned, which is a direct quote. The stuff about his dad, which we'll, we'll get into later, that was, again, us victimizing him rather than the other way around. Like, nothing, he doesn't do anything. Things happen to him. Right. This is a pro tip. Whenever somebody is perpetually the victim, those are red flags. It's just <laughs> that simple. Like, we cannot let fandom be such big blinders. Winning was already going to do the work for Novak. When a player who is having all these issues of whatever, whatever kind, once they win, a lot of stuff gets forgiven by their fans, by the commentary, by sponsors. The whole discourse just naturally shifts on its own. But that's not enough. Stefano Tsitsipas makes his second Grand Slam final, the first of which Novak forgot about, which was so funny to me. Mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, he put on a fairly embarrassing display in that a final. Star. <laughs> it was, I mean, he, he won more games than what the quarter and the semifinalists. Okay, well, you are <laughs> Stefano Tsitsipas. Yes, and people thought you had like a reasonable chance to challenge Novak. And sure, Novak played out of his mind. He played impregnable tennis it was like it was a stunning display of tennis mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but at this stage in your career at your big age as you like to say <laughs> with your experiences this is your second slam final uh, you are no stranger to playing Djokovic on this stage yes it's the first time at this <laughs> at this stage but come on yes and Novak had made nine Australian Open finals and had never lost one it just, it wasn't happening. I did not expect him to win. Oh, okay. But I expected to him play to put up more of a fight. Mm -hmm. Nothing mm -hmm. about this final felt anything but inevitable. Right. I but watched it. Maybe grab one of those tie breaks. I don't know how fans of Tsitsipas do this, but you have your fave in these important matches, and you just know that a shank is coming on an important point. Like, that would drive me up the wall. Yeah. Karen Hachanov into the quarterfinals, has now made the quarters at every slam. Love to see it. Sebastian Korda unfortunately had to retire in their match with a wrist injury. So I hope not, that's not serious. Yuji Lahechka into his first slam quarterfinal. Thank you, Pat, for yes. giving us the brush-up lesson on how to pronounce... <laughs> That gentleman's first name. Fixing uh, our Czech pronunciation. I forgot how uh, the R is pronounced. Like in uh, Lucy Safasheva's last name. You have the uh, the Bue tragedy on here. What do you mean by that? It just feels seriously unkind to even bring this up. That was one of the first things that was put on the agenda after the last episode. And it was just an absolute destruction of an opponent by yeah, Novak Djokovic. Yeah. And to see Mr. Rublev go through the anguish of it in real time was, it was a lot. Losing again in a slam quarterfinal. This time, I mean, nobody is going to criticize you for losing to Djokovic here. Uh, but yes, as you said, the the mental anguish that he goes through on court and, and getting kind of demolished in that way is hard to watch. And taking with it this with a grain of salt because no player is totally um trustworthy but i really i just really like him like i really want to like him yeah i mean you, you know you dig even two inches into the soil of any <laughs> any player's life they don't have to be perfect 
and you will find something. <laughs> so it's often an exercise in futility, hedging your bets, yeah, in keeping a safe distance and just being prepared. But I say here the boy tragedy because every single time he upped the ante with his boy, it went into the net. Oh. <laughs> or it went wide. Like the oh. boy <laughs> It wasn't helping. The weights deployed by him in this match is meant to accentuate. Right. To to put an accent on, to put the finishing touch on a point. And it was often catastrophic. Oh dear. Tommy Paul reached the semifinals. He beat Ben Shelton in the quarters. Both of those guys had massive tournaments. Ben, as you know, is playing in, what, his second slam? And very famously, they kept saying that he had never been abroad. He's such an exciting player to watch. And I think you tweeted something about, you know, when he overcomes the deficiencies in his game, like, he's going to be a a big star. The many deficiencies in his game. (laughs) Like, this dude has so much to work on and yet he's still 44 in the world making the quarterfinals at this tournament his serve could easily become the best serve in the game you think so easily and he has a lot of improvement still to do on that especially the serve out wide from the ground the backhand is a mess (laughs) i'm i'm i should go back and check the stats but i'm not even sure he hit one winner in that quarterfinal off the backhand for a large stretch of that match he had hit zero winners off the backhand Mm. The forehand, when he's able to get into position, is destructive. But his movement to the forehand out wide, kind of poor at this stage in his career. He's so young, and so you'd expect these improvements to be made. Right. I think watching him in that quarterfinal was an exercise in reminding me to have restraint and not get carried away with where he is in his career. Because... When you watch him play Tommy Paul in that quarterfinal, and then you imagine what Novak Djokovic would have done to him, it may have been a triple bagel. Because... (laughs) Well, this is a different... Right. Because you cannot hit through Novak from the baseline. He's shown that that's damn near impossible on that court. Mm -hmm. And nobody... The thing for me that sets Novak apart from everybody else in tennis is his movement. And especially on a hard court... Nobody can move on a hard court like Novak Djokovic on the men's side. And what that does is that it keeps him in every single point. Because you think you have an open shot down the line. He can take two quick steps and slide out out wide and use that forehand that's typically in a defensive position for most players to then become a weapon and within one or two strokes have him winning the point easily. Mm -hmm. That's something that Ben Shelton is eons away from being able to do and i don't know if you can teach somebody to have that instinct and movement on the court when it's so clearly not natural to them at this early stage in their career i'm sure he can get better i just don't know how great he can be at it but in a men's game that's dominated by those two guys at the top you you cannot get into the upper echelons of the game without having really good movement Tsitsipas, one of the best movers on tour Tommy Paul was moving like a gazelle around the court. Say what you want about him or his game, like his his foot movement on court is so much improved. The thing is, those two guys at the top are not going to be dominating for very much longer. Right, but they... You don't have to... Right, but the legacy of that will remain. <laughs> they, sure, they've, but they've created, there's a drop-off in level. Sure, but they've created a whole group of players who now are able to move close enough. Right. Who, because they absolutely had to, to thrive. Exactly. So I don't want this to be like a a downer on Ben Shelton. I want it to be a an optimistic thing. Oh, the, like, no. To get where like, he did mm-hmm. with all these glaring deficiencies in his game and seemingly having this et cetera quality to him as a potential tennis star, <laughs> there's so much further he can go. We have been talking a little about how the men's tournament was maybe less exciting than it has been in, I don't know, decades. But, uh, (laughs) well, actually, there's no but. I was just going to talk about a story I saw in the Herald Sun. Channel 9 in Australia recently re-upped their contract, spent 500 million Australian dollars to extend their TV rights until 2030. And this year's Australian Open saw a 40% drop in ratings, which is 
uh, understandable because Barty has retired. Nick wasn't here. Nick was getting huge numbers for doubles matches last year. But, you know, you do wonder if they're a little bit afraid. What, you know, what happens? Did we invest our money wisely? Did we get a good price? And so the Herald Sun interviewed this media expert named Colin Vickery and said, quote, Despite Djokovic being arguably the greatest player of all time, when it comes to ratings, he doesn't deliver like he does on the court. Like, damn. And that's a little rough, but the point, I think, going forward is that tennis is struggling with identifying major personalities internationally. Much of that is the sport's own fault. It's the huge, massive investment in the big three on the ATP side. And of course, yeah, they did the next gen and everything. They really tried with Alexander Zverev, but they missed out on personalities. Well, people who had actually had good personalities. There are also a lot of people who after last year will not watch a Novak Djokovic match, period. Mm. End of story. I don't think that's to be discounted. <laughs> you know, I think his support has become a lot more rabid and vociferous, as we saw with uh, a lot of the crowds in, at the actual matches. But yes. I think he, he pissed off a lot of people. So his support is more segmented. Yes. I don't want to harp on that too much. So let's get into the doubles action. You know, my faves. Krejcikova, Sinyakova win yet another slam. They are actually going for the non-calendar year slam. And saying that doesn't actually do it justice because they have won the past four slams that they entered already. They didn't play Roland Garros last year because Barbara had COVID, but they repeated this year at the Australian and then won Wimbledon in the US Open. A fun fact, Barbara has actually won the Australian Open five times, all in a row. She won three consecutive mixed titles and then two consecutive women's doubles titles. On the men's side, Rinki Hichikata and Jason Kubler, they become the second consecutive Aussie men's pair to win doubles in Melbourne. And the second consecutive unseeded pair. These guys were outs both outside of the top 150 in doubles. They beat Nice and Zielinski uh, from Monaco and Poland, respectively. A fun fact, another. I have another fun fact. The Monaco and Poland flag are mirror images of each other. Oh. Yeah. Monaco has a red stripe on the top and white on the bottom. Poland is the opposite. These two beat the number one seeds, the number eight seeds, and the number six seeds on their way to this title. The Australian pair. Yes. In mixed doubles, it was almost a perfect swan song send-off for Sanya Mirza, making the mixed doubles final alongside Rohan Bopana. Sadly, they lose to Matos and Stefani. There was a lot of excitement online, on Twitter, about this mixed doubles final Obviously, there it was driven by Mirza's imminent retirement, but it was cool to see mixed doubles carried by the major networks, at least here in North America, and put at a time where we could actually watch it. I think it was too late for Brazil, unfortunately, for their opponents and the victors. But for you know many points, Mirza was dictating with her famous forehand. She carried in that match. She did. She carried in a lot of their run to that final as well. <laughs> and you, Rohan Bopana is a doubles legend, but he's 42 years old. And you mentioned to me he would play some points that were pristine, gorgeous. I mean, not just pristine, then... just have electric moments of brilliance on court, mm -hmm. followed by, as Michael Caine would say in Miss Congeniality, that. <laughs> Did you just say that as a quotation? Yes. <laughs> it's one That's of impressive. It's one of the be <laughs> the most amazing moments in all of film history. Oh, unfortunately, Bopano got in some long baseline rallies with Rafael Matos and lost most of them. Stefani is electric. People were excited to watch her, both Stefani and Matos. But in the trophy presentation, Luisa was clearly the star. They showed they both showed so much deference to Sonia and Rohan, praising them for their influence and their amazing careers. Uh, but Louisa has such a sparkling personality. She even found time to tell a story. While this is Sonia's final slam as a professional athlete, she still has one more tournament to play. 
She said that she will retire from tennis after the Dubai tournament. Thus far, she's won 43 doubles titles, the most among active players. She's been number one in the world uh, for 91 weeks, won six major titles, three in women's doubles and three in mixed, and is one of the most famous athletes in all of South Asia. This part of the episode is where we deal with some of the observations that we've seen over the last two weeks, some of the maybe off-court issues that have happened, stuff that wasn't just between the lines. And something I want to know is why do commentators insist on telling us that Rybakina is Russian-born at this point? Every time. Every match. There seem, Honestly, there seems to be this sense among American commentators that she's done a bait-and-switch on us, that she somehow doesn't deserve to be here. And that she should be dealt with suspicion. Mm -hmm. That she's done something nefarious. That with every other Russian player and Belarusian player and Ukrainian player who's had to talk about and made to answer for and give their opinions on the current war, she gets to escape that because of this nifty little trick that she did. (laughs) When in fact, her story is very common in tennis. Mm -hmm. Her story is not dissimilar to Naomi Osaka's. The Russian Federation would not fund her. The Kazakh Federation said, come on down, as they've done with so many other Russian players over, over the years. And this predates the invasion, the current invasion in Ukraine. I'm not going to say that the the shift in federation predates the war because the aggressions in Ukraine have been going on for a long time. Right, in some way since about 2014. But she talked about this a ton at Wimbledon. I'm not really sure why it's not enough. I, I mean, I think the reason it's not enough is that several of the American commentators are very uninformed in general. McEnroe didn't even know who Lehechka was, the quarterfinalist. Right, and you've been assigned a match. It's your job to find out who that person is. Right? I mean, it's like the most basic stuff. You're commentating on a final. You need to know who the player is beat. Like it is it is literally the bare minimum. Cam Nori, Isla Tomlanovic. There are so many players who've switched, switched nationalities mm. for whatever reason. So why is Rybakina being treated differently here? A number of the et cetera's have to do with nationalism. So that's one. Um, I know you've you've tweeted about recently how you really don't like the display of flags at tennis tournaments. I don't either. I, I don't like nationalism in sport. It makes me very uncomfortable. And it also kind of makes me chuckle when people say tennis is not political because uh, very obviously it is. It's built into the fiber. Victoria Azarenka in her press conferences aligned herself with Novak Djokovic on a couple of occasions to go at the media to say that they have done her wrong, which I'm sure they have in the past. Everybody's done wrong by the media at some point. Mm -hmm. But this project to paint the media with one nefarious brush so as to give yourself immunity from talking about things, because this is where it's going now, right? Mm. Everybody has positioned themselves to say, it's not just enough that I'm going to stay out of it. I'm not going to offer my thoughts. I'm going to go a step further to say, well, I can't trust you because anything I say is going to be used against me. Mm -hmm. Like I, nothing I say is going to be taken for what it is. But it's, it's a push to inoculate themselves against any pushback. I mean, just, just call it what it is, right? At this point. Or just say like, I'm excusing myself. But what Vika is saying is I'm excusing myself from talking about this because you all, you collective, lie and you twist. Where, like, yeah, some some reporters do that. But it's kind of funny to me because tennis has, uh, compared to some other sports and compared to, like, the real world, has a fairly sycophantic press corps. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) You know, like, they may, you know... 
report a few things badly or sensationalize something you said. Sometimes they get it completely wrong. But overall, a lot of reporters at tournaments are fans. Or on the payroll. Yeah, and don't get... I mean, some of the most trusted, supposedly, newspapers in the world, and I won't name which ones, but you know what I'm talking about, some of those reporters who've been in those positions for decades have really just become stenographers. Specifically, uh, when asked about Djokovic and the flag situation, she gave some answer about how sports and politics shouldn't be you know mixed or whatever and i'm i'm watching that and i'm thinking vika please you are on the players council you have advocated for maternity leave you arguably are solely responsible for this three-year maternity leave policy that is a political thing like the choice not to have it was political and the choice to institute it or being forced to institute it is political Like, this was kind of the point of the second wave of feminism, that the personal is political. I also don't really understand when people say, like, well, war isn't political, a flag isn't political. It's like you're you're tallying the things that are not political, which are very clearly political. Mm -hmm. The fact that you play team competitions under a flag for a nation is a political thing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. The fact that you want to win something for your country, that's a political thing. So... If there's something that you don't want to talk about or you don't care about, say that. Or just stay silent. You know, and that's fine too. Yeah. But like to take it a step further and hitch your wagon to to Novak and say, well, I have been a victim too. Sure, but I think what's more like, yes, if you don't want to talk about it, don't talk about it. I think what's more interesting is that players from countries like Belarus and Serbia and Russia and Ukraine have a much higher burden and they are forced to answer questions that western players are not right like this is the double standard and i think i think that's the resentment but they are not articulating it exactly and Uh, it's totally fair yeah right why should i be made to answer for things that other players aren't you know there are all Mm -hmm. these other players from nations whose governments the United States, have done messed up things around the world and still do. Why aren't you asking right. American players about that? Why are they allowed to compete under their flag? And the reason is they're more powerful and they get to create the standard. <laughs> that's that's it, right? And so the double standard is real. It's unjust. The inequities in tennis are political. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like Everything about the sport is political. So I, I honestly, I do get the frustration I get the anger. Equal criticism needs to be applied to the West. And to be clear, Vika does have reason to be pissed off about things that have happened to her in the past. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying yeah. that she she doesn't. I'm just saying there's a conflating of things here to serve a very convenient purpose. Speaking of flags... Yeah, now, this is kind of related. Uh, Serjan Djokovic, Novak's father, was filmed posing with a bunch of Novak supporters, one of whom had this big Serbian flag with Vladimir Putin's face in the center of it. One of the people was wearing a shirt with a Z on it, which supposedly uh, signifies support for the Russian military invasion of Ukraine. This person was also seen in the stadium and had to change his shirt. Obviously, this spurred a lot of criticism of the elder Djokovic, a lot of anger. Uh, You know, (laughs) I don't really know where to start here. I think where I first went is that Djokovic's parents have been very, very embarrassing to him over the years. And I I always had this theory, and and I don't know if it's true, but this was always my guess, was that when he started becoming a dominant player, you started seeing them less and less. And I thought, well, maybe his agents or him were saying, like, you guys are embarrassing. You know, you got in a fight with Roger. You always say outrageous things. I I honestly felt like they were pushed aside a little bit to clean up the image. And I could be completely wrong about that. But now they're back and there's drama. Endless drama. They invited Nigel Farage or Farage to their house. They said that Novak was being crucified. I mean... 
all sorts of bizarre things happening during the the deportation saga last year. This year, you know, he is at quote unquote accidentally pictured with people who have Vladimir Putin on their flags. I don't know what happened. I I don't speak Serbian, so I do not know what what was said. He was accused of kind of cheersing these guys who said something that equated to like long live the Russians. Mm -hmm. I don't know what was said. And there's even debate because the audio quality is not that great. There's debate among people who speak Serbian. The explanation that was given was that after every one of Novak's matches, Papa went out into the crowds as they assembled outside of Rod Laver Arena and went to take pictures, meet with the people. Meet with Novak's people. Mm-hmm. Which he does. He he does that. And it just so happened that this time, he didn't really know the situation that he had gotten himself in. And when he did, he ran away. And, you know, I, I don't think that's implausible. Mm. As somebody who doesn't speak Serbian, I think that's... It makes sense to a, a fair degree. What happens with Novak and his parents now is that Given everything that's happened, given the coziness to dictators previously, given the the deportation saga, the Nigel Farage business, all these other things, some folks are less likely to give him a blind. To say, well, okay, let's, yeah, that makes sense. It's okay, fine. You know, I can see that at play here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to come down harshly one way or the other on that because the response to it is also in a sense out of step with how Djokovic has handled his entire presence in Australia right like it wasn't like a double down of well Mm. I'm being persecuted in this regard he actually took steps the two of them to not inflame the situation no I think he actually knew oh shit this is this is bad for me yeah. And that's what I'm saying about his parents. I think he saw that and was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, he really did this. And these are his parents. He loves them, obviously. But you have to think Djokovic, the businessman, was like, really? I've got to deal with this now in the semifinal of a major? And maybe he blamed the media. Maybe he didn't blame his dad. <laughs> <laughs> but still, regardless of who he blamed... It was another problem that he had to sort out while he was trying to play a tennis tournament. It wasn't like an outright condemnation of either side. Uh, It wasn't what his statement wasn't deeply politicized. He said the family had experienced war. They had experienced trauma and they don't support war at all. I don't know where the Djokovic's political leanings are. And I don't really care. Like, that's, to me, that's not what was important about the story. What was interesting to me was how the Australian Open handled this sort, this situation. Yeah. Because when folks are showing up last year with Where is Peng Shui t-shirts, they're removed oh. from the site. Post haste. Immediate more. Mm-hmm. And when folks are being overtly political about anti-homophobia in tennis... That becomes an issue too. Yeah. You can do it only on Pride Day. Right. Only on Pride Day. But this dude gets to change his shirt and come back subsequent days. Yeah. Like that that's crazy to me. Like this is a double standard of the highest order with Craig Tyler. Yes. Craig was a puppy with his tail between his legs with Novak this year. I have to give it up to whichever editor at the age wrote this headline. Quote, Tylee backs Serjan Djokovic over, quote, misinterpretation, wants crackdown on clock milking. (laughs) The way that they set up that binary was just delicious to me because it's meant to mock. Yes, it's meant to be looked at with irony, right? Fight the real enemy. (laughs) Clock milking. And Craig was quoted... When, when they say oh, clock oh, milking... I'm so sorry. That no, no, that's so not what I meant. Filthy. I wasn't going there. You <laughs> gave yourself away. Are they talking about players who are taking too much time to start points? Are they talking about the ball kids taking too much time on the clock while they're not being paid <laughs> to complete their tasks? Yes, time theft for an unpaid job. 
<laughs> Who is it that's doing the milking here? <laughs> and Craig even said, we've got to look at no lets. We've got to look at the length of time between points, the length of the warm up. Dude, what are you talking about? Out of all of the things that happened at this Australian Open, those are the problems. Time of the warm up. It's a Dude. look over there. Exactly. It's a distraction moment. It's look at these things that I'm not responsible for and have no way of changing. Those are the things that are the problem. One final thing on this. You mentioned how Surgeon referred to Novak in a Jesus-like manner. Yes. In his alleged persecution last year. And that really set the tone for the ramping up of the victimhood. And... What's crazy to me is, oh, it's not crazy at all. It's totally believable. It's just just so wholly disappointing. Is how all these tennis players are simping for him now that he's won. <laughs> it's re- it's funny. Too. Vashik Pospisil out well, here is tweeting that he's never been more happy for anybody else to win a tennis match. Sir, like, you two are a tennis player. Yourself? Didn't you win major titles as in doubles? Like I don't understand. <laughs> Everybody framing it like, oh, it's it's crazy. The, the mental fortitude, the strength, it's just unprecedented for this man to have overcome what he went through last year to what was done to him. This is a GOAT performance from the GOAT. Let's wrap it up, pack it up, put a ribbon on a we ball We should all it. retire. What I don't... Get, so Vashek is not surprising, but... All of the other players who actually competed at this tournament, like, do you guys want to win or what? I want to hear from the players who are like, uh, eh, bored. Where are they? Because <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know there's some bad mind players out there like us. Yeah. <laughs> he has solidified his power across yes. many facets his of influence. tennis mm-hmm. after this tournament. So next episode, I do actually want to talk about money again. I, there's a lot of interesting things to talk about with the PTPA and who funds it. Okay, so make an yeah, agenda. I will. Okay. <laughs> the next issue that we're talking about, as Yelena Rybakina made her run through the draw, more and more attention started to be paid to her coach and the way he speaks to her, quite frankly. Mm. Stefano Vukov is the name. Videos were circulating from the times when on-court coaching was allowed and some of the things he said to her in those instances. Rybakina is a grown woman at this point. So the preface here is that we have to have an acknowledgement and a respect for her agency in this situation, right? Yes. The counter is that you might see this and say, he's talking to her crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right, like... that's that's the, the whole point of it. Yeah. And so Pam Shriver tweets, I believe sometime around the semifinal. I, I could be wrong about that. Quote, as I watch Rybakina try to win her second major in seven months, I hope she finds a coach who speaks and treats her with respect at all times and does not ever accept anything less. There's a bit of added context that's naturally infused into this discussion because Pam is the one who is bringing it up. Because Pam has been very vocal about safeguarding in tennis, talking about her own story at the hands of a predatory coach. People are taking it as a given that she's infusing a predatory nature to this coach-pupil relationship. When on our last episode, we made very clear that safeguarding constitutes multiple facets, right? It's not just issues of sexual predation. It's about how people talk to each other, (laughs) you know, on a very simple, basic level. It's a scale. You know, not all types of abuse or disrespect are equal, of course. And nobody's saying that, right? Like, and, and some people have different levels of tolerance for that kind of thing. However, Dmitry Tursunov seemed to take it that way. Well, right. And as you said, like, now the things that Pam says are going to be taken in, in the context of abuse or exploitation, 
that's not always what's meant by what she says, you know. Mm-hmm. So the the story takes off when uh, some seven hours later, Tursunov shows up in her mentions to say, one, Pam, I have respected you as an entity in tennis, but lately I've seen you write a lot of questionable things. This one has to top it off. In your quest to vilify random people in tennis for odd reasons, you have openly and publicly insulted a man who is solely responsible for the fact that you even know who Elena Rybakina is. You have zero clue what you are talking about, and at the very least owe a public apology to a man who is a great coach in every sense of that word. You'd be lucky to ever reach that level and every player would be lucky to have someone like that in their corner. The man is loyal to his player with every atom of his body and soul. It's a shame you have proved time and time again that you are blind to see anything than a bunch of gestures. Can we? I don't want to take too long, but can we do a close reading of that? There's can I so feel, much to comb over first here. First of all, I real I want him to list the other instances where she's been wildly incorrect because I, now i'm very curious i want to know what the other questionable things are exactly what are they because you've said you've seen her write a lot a lot of questionable <laughs> things how about vukov is solely responsible for us knowing who Rybakin is wow solely solely wow this man is, is that saying you... that this other man is completely and entirely responsible for this woman's success. So as a coach of women, is that how you see your players? Like that when they achieve something, it's it's because of you? Of course. And this is part of why Oof. we are so skeptical, even before Pam came forward with her story, about this ratcheting up of the cult of personality of tennis coaches. Because they want us to believe that their role is so outsized that they are indispensable. Yeah. When in fact, <laughs> these male coaches in women's tennis, it's a pass around donkey situation. <laughs> like literally from one to the next, one to the next, a carousel. And we are made to believe that it's the player's fault. That these women don't have their heads screwed on right. That they don't know what's best for them. And these male coaches leave... Because the women are not listening to them. They don't want to do what they are told. It's very convenient because if she wins a major, it, you've done it. Right. But if she fires you and has been playing poorly, that's totally her fault. Right. Um, let's, let's not even talk about the very odd public relationship he had with Arena. Do you remember I Need You, D? We did a, we actually did a, dramatic reading Mm. of that instagram post and arena sabalenka finally won her major without him right which may make him feel a little sore it's quite curious that he's being so loud about this when none of his charges have done what sabalenka did or rebakina has done now to be very clear we're not saying that vukov is abusive or or any of these things no this is only a critique of what terzanov came with but let's talk about how pam could only wish to achieve the level i'm presuming he means as a coach pam has won 22 major titles she's one of the greatest doubles players in history she had to play against martina and steffi at wimbledon that's Not exactly what's happening in 2022-23. No, I understand that. I think that he's talking about (laughs) her record as a coach. The most recent history of that is coaching a player from the doldrums to the quarterfinals (laughs) of the Australian Open. Not the doldrums. I mean, where did she come from? (laughs) By Tursunov's metrics, Pam deserves all the credit. She's solely (laughs) responsible for this phoenix rising from the tennis ashes. And where does his, where did uh, his player lose? It gets more delicious because who is he coaching right now? Belinda Banjic. <laughs> she, I mean, she also made it far, but she lost to his previous pupil, mm-hmm. Sabalenka. Yes, and so he was unable to keep Belinda in the conversation because, again, by his metrics, he is solely responsible for her failures. 
I mean, this thing is just wild. I see a lot of people coming for Pam saying, well, you started this, you were being messy, blah, 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 blah. You're setting up a dichotomy between you, you know, the two of us and you all who are on your couches watching tennis from very remote places against somebody who's been on tour for 40 something years, kind of knows what she's talking about and didn't specifically talk about anything about predator behavior in her tweet. No, and like these people are also in the tunnel. They're in the locker rooms. At like, breakfast. Journalists and broadcasters know more than us, period. Uh, it's just a fact. Like there's a lot of shit that goes on that, you know, maybe we hear a tidbit from somebody, but there's so much we don't know. Now, here's what I want to posit now. What I think is happening here, in part, is because of the conversations that are now being had around WTA players having all men setups, having solely men in their camps, and this story hopefully gaining some traction, these men who have been passed around feeling no real threat that they wouldn't be able to get any old job that they want. Because what we're seeing is a whole bunch of middling professional players who know that once they're done, they can go and coach anybody in the WTA. The And the women should be happy for right? it. Because, the world yeah. of women's tennis is their oyster. They can do whatever they want, whenever they want. I'm not here to say that getting a job in tennis is easy with coaching. What I'm saying here is that Advocating for women to be coaching women and for more women to be part of players' teams and for men to be held accountable for their behavior, that is seen as a threat. That is seen yes. as a threat to their jobs. That is a, seen as a threat to their unquestioned reign over the profession. Mm -hmm. And you have, so you have one person doing this. I personally, I wouldn't have tweeted that. What Pam tweeted, that's her prerogative to tweet whatever she wants. But what we're seeing is like, this is a mini Me Too backlash. Tennis is a dinosaur sport. Tennis is a very conservative sport. Progressive values take a long time to reach it. So if there is a full kind of Me Too reckoning in this sport, it will be chaotic. Uh, we've seen how these men brand themselves as masterminds. We've... Like Patrick? We've seen how they take responsibility as being the sole architects of women's success. Torsten have said as much mm. in as many words yeah. in this tweet. And so the more access to these jobs we create for women is the more that cult of personality, that idea that they've built up over time is demystified. So I think that's part of what is going on here because the response, while it's not even remotely surprising that a man would come out of left field to just go wholeheartedly full tilt in defense of another man who he thinks is imperiled. That's not surprising. The response was totally out of proportion. And frankly, so disrespectful. If I'm Pam Shriver and Dmitry Tursunov comes to talk to me like that, ooh, like it is going to be curtains. <laughs> Rybakina did... Uh respond with fake news mm -hmm. saying like this is not an issue basically saying like stay out of it pam uh, and again like she is a grown woman in her mid-20s she can choose to associate with whomever she wants this coach has been a success for her on paper so i don't know what's going on but uh i guarantee we'll we will see more of it yeah and so the angle that we take in talking about this is to question why Dmitry Tursunov is doing what he's doing. Yes. We have a lot of like one sentence bullet points here. Okay. You mentioned the ball kids are not paid. That sucks. A ball kid almost interfered with Stefanos Tsitsipas, meaning Stefanos smashed the ball into the backstop. A ball kid could have run into it, wasn't too far away. Stefanos has, uh, has flirted with default many times now. At when was this? At Wimbledon, he slammed a ball into the scoreboard. Could have easily hit somebody. The fact that he didn't hit somebody was uh, an act of God. But the kid, the man, not the kid, the grown man, needs to be careful. He needs to be careful because he will get defaulted at some oh, point. Oh, but you just referring to Stefanos as a kid? Well, he acts like a kid. 
Ooh, ooh. I corrected myself because thinking, yeah. I know you don't like that. I thought you were talking about the ball kids. Oh, no. That it was actually a grown man who was being a ball kid. <laughs> I was so confused. Oh. <laughs> the Australian Open is the only slam that does not compensate its ball kids. I know. I love this. All the responses, I tweeted something about this and all, well, not all, but some of the responses were like, it's a life changing opportunity and they get to meet players and I've done it and it, it was the greatest memory of my life. Like, I, I do not doubt any of those things. I'm, I do not discount it. My question is, is it work? Is it work? Could the tournament function without it? No. Pay them. And the argument that, oh, they can't afford it. No, no. This wasn't a COVID thing. It's no financial disaster. This happened in 2009 or 2008. Sometime back there, they made the decision to stop paying the ball kids. And then the gall. Somebody said... The audacity. The, the, the absolute nerve. Somebody suggested to me that the parents aren't getting paid for waiting around to pick up their child. Like, yeah, no shit. Why the fuck should they get paid? Maybe that was disproportionate, but I had never heard something like that in my life. So what is the argument? That because the parents aren't being paid to wait till 4 a.m. for the, Andy Morgan to be done. The children don't deserve it. The either. children shouldn't? Yeah. Where do people come off with these ludicrous trains of thought? Anyway, if my child was out at a tennis match till 4 a.m. running around for Andy Murray, I would expect compensation. And if Stefanos hit my child with a ball... There's no workers' compensation. We're suing. All right? Speaking of the balls, a lot of players had serious problems. Felix complained. Jesse Pagula complained in her, what, quarterfinal? She was not happy it, in that match. It appeared that some of these balls came out dead. Like fresh balls out of the can. Craig says, look over there. Nothing <laughs> to see here, folks. <laughs> it's the same old ball we've been using. Uh, Y'all need to get your strings re-strung, your yeah. heads recalibrated, you need to go see the optician, <laughs> maybe you're not hearing the ball properly, do you need to clean out the wax? You need to work on your tennis IQ, girl, because these are the same balls, it's just not as hot as last year. Nothing to see here. <laughs> <laughs> Who believes Uncle Craig at this point in time? This is a man who has extended his credibility to the limit and that elasticity like a lot of those balls no longer exists <laughs> the, wow oh my god the metaphor the literary devices people come to us for i told you i'm an oral expert what? the kits i will admit i don't remember many of them except for the goat i the thought you said the one. kids no, the kits, the tennis clothing. Francis Tiafo won this. It was done and dusted on day one. That outfit that looked like a jumper. I mean, can you imagine no, if it were a jumper? Nobody else could carry it off like him. It was done on day one. A lot of people didn't like it. What do you say to those people? Uh, you know, I say that that is a hundred percent your right. Oh, you're allowed not to like it. You're allowed to be wrong. Mm. You're allowed to be against the force of history, oh. but it's your prerogative not to like it. Mm -hmm. It's sub totally subjective. Francis Tiafo, who, by the way, was hanging out with one Miss Anita Baker last night. I mean, his life just seems so cool. Miss Baker is a tennis auntie. Like, she loves tennis. As so many of those great 70s, 80s, black vocal icons the do and the soul did. divas gladys knight aretha franklin aretha out there with her camcorder <laughs> at tennis matches they were all tennis dance that has to tell you something about our sport that these women are super fans who else did you like i i don't honestly i do not remember anybody else i did not oh, like i like coco's and I don't always, but I thought it was super cute. I love the simplicity of it. You know how I love black and white. And then it had the color trim to it. Mm -hmm. It was just spot on for me. Did not like Tsitsipas's beach trunks. That It looked like beach shorts, board no. shorts that he was wearing. His shorts never... I guess that's how he likes them to fit. 
but they never really look like they fit properly. I I don't think there were many catastrophic kit moments no. at this tournament. I'm, the Australian Open is where you go to be bold. And I, I didn't feel like a lot of people were super bold. The non-Francis version of that kit was worn by Vika, uh, by Sabalenka. I thought it was fine. Yeah. I, I mean, some people were like, it's so horrible. I didn't think it was groundbreaking, but I thought it was cute. Vika has found a style of kit that works for her. Yes, it's her signature shorts. And not just the shorts, the leggings. It doesn't always work for me aesthetically. It clearly works for her practically. Mm-hmm. But I thought it worked in both ways. Yes. At this tournament. I will say this. I, I liked Djokovic's kit. Specifically with the white top. When he went blue on blue, didn't care for that as much. Mm. Well, at all. God, he wears a lot of blue. Lacoste always has mm-hmm. him in blue. And Lacoste is a super nice brand. But I just I find his kits super boring. I mean, it's very predictable, but he almost never looks bad. That's true. Almost Absolutely. never looks bad. Mm-hmm. And I will say his trophy picture shoot thing super casual and people are comparing what he did to what arena did they're opposite ends of the spectrum (laughs) arena has her leg skyward in an ankle length bridgerton pink frilly dress oh my god on a gondola in the middle of the river and novak is just there with a a deep green polo and khaki shorts and like that's what he's gonna do He's going to, when he dresses up for Labor Cup, he's going to give you a bomber jacket or a Mm -hmm. letterman jacket. Yeah. And while you may take issue with the super casual nature of it, that color combination is one of my absolute favorite. What? That deep green and khaki combo. I I absolutely love it. Yeah. Yeah. One year I was in Charleston and they had all the ball kids dressed like that. I was like, this is stunning. Serve. (laughs) Serve ball kids. (laughs) Let's talk about the decision for ESPN to keep their broadcast team stateside for this tournament. Mm -hmm. The green screens, the mismatch audio from who was in studio to who was courtside. Yeah. Between Fowler and Mary Jo and Darren and Renee courtside. They think we're stupid. Well, I don't just don't pretend like you're there. Right? Just say, hey, we're in Connecticut. <laughs> the green screen is so silly to me. This like this is 2023. People know what it looks like. What's interesting to me here is this is, for me, uh, another manifestation of what business looks like after March 2020. After companies figured out what they didn't really need to do where they could cut expenses and just don't give a fuck because mm-hmm. we don't we don't ever need to go back to spending that money again that's well that's interesting uh yeah i think covid has something to do with it but it also says something really sad about where tennis is right now that they weren't willing to invest the money to send the McEnroe brothers down to australia and to set up like a base that's not great not great bob with Nike dumping tennis players, with ESPN failing to send commentators down to Australia, it's not a good sign for this sport. A sport that is very popular around the world, both recreationally and professionally. They are not making the money that they should. ESPN in the US? I feel like that's a charitable take. I mean, I don't know. I don't know their numbers. I'm just saying even if they were making money, they see this as a savings. That they, oh, totally. I and mean, I'm, I'm saying maybe that, I'm extrapolating too far here, but it it gives me a bad feeling. I'm saying that this is par for the course with businesses across many industries. That even yes, if that's true, even that's if true. you are making the same money as you did in January 2020, COVID has shown us that we don't need to spend that money. Yes. And we need to constantly be in growth mode or we're failing. So cut, cut, cut. We had this Cosmos 25-year deal for Davis Cup saga on every single one of our Australian Open 
agendas and we will be pushing it again <laughs> to the next episode because you know we are an hour and a half into this recording and I certainly do not have the bandwidth really, for this. Like you all don't care at this point. I, so I actually did my research this time. I, I'm prepared to talk about it, but I think it will fit better on the next episode and we'll find out if the ITF countersues Cosmos. Ooh, ooh, stay hmm. tuned. We, we can talk a little bit of mess about PK and Shakira, though. Oh, my God. Because you didn't. I told you about this and you had no idea. <laughs> I thought Shakira was going to prison. I mean, I'm so behind. Is she still going to prison or what? I like, believe she has been vindicated. Okay. But apparently, Shakira found out that Gerard... Mr. PK, senor? ...was cheating because yeah. some person was eating her strawberry jam how disrespectful like when you are with somebody for that long and you open your refrigerator and all of a sudden they decide to eat the strawberry jam you know something's up you're eating the strawberry jam of one of the most famous musical artists in the world if i cook a pineapple brown stew chicken and there's leftovers in the fridge and I see it's not there, the only option is you've either thrown it out or some other heifer <laughs> is eating my food. Because you aren't doing it. <laughs> These patterns do not change. You don't all of a sudden... <laughs> yes, there, so for some reason, Shakira knew that it was not Gerard who ate the strawberry jam. Also, video came out of Gerard's mom laying hands on Miss Shakira. Did you see that? Yes, and apparently... Um, absolutely not. Shakira has a house across the way in view of the mother-in-law, and she put up a witch on the balcony. A bruja? A straw <laughs> puppet witch. Wait, who did? Shakira. Oh, Pointed oh, wow. in the direction of the mother-in-law. <laughs> like, this is some unholy mess. Mm -hmm. And I wonder where Mr. Pereira is in this divorce. Wait. Mr. Nadal Pareda? Yeah, like he was in Shakira's video, <laughs> but he's besties with PK. Yeah, um, I don't know. The point is, Gerard is having a very bad month. And I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I just live for the mess. Uh, a bit more about tennis. We always do ranking movers after slams. There were some big ones. Ben Shelton uh, cut his ranking in half, going up 45 spots to number 44. Lahechka is up to 39. That's a 32 spot shift. Tommy Paul makes his top 20 debut at number 19. JJ Wolf up to number 48. Michael Moe to his career high of number 83. Some unfortunate news is that Rafa lost four spots to number six. Rafa being the defending champ and losing early in the tournament. Finalist from last year, Medvedev also plummets four spots to number 12. <laughs> you said plummet. Like, it's only four spots. That's a lot for somebody like well, him. Well, it's out of the and top 10. No longer in the top 10. I want to say, though, that I know you are terminally bored by Tommy Paul. Wholly <laughs> disinterested. <laughs> he has a cute game. Okay. I like the way he moves on court. It's very compact. It's very fluid. And I think he has a lot of talent that's been cultivated through a lot of hard work i don't think this is a flash in the pan is what i'm saying okay i am very extremely turned off by the frat bro behavior sure i mean i am also mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not a hater I, i'm just know. saying i've watched more tennis than i have in a 30 day stretch this past month than i ever have in my entire life and part of that was oh that absolutely could not be me <laughs> this year Yes. <laughs> no. You miss you misspent that time is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, part of that is I was able to take in some players that I usually just ignore. Okay. And uh, he, he was one of them. On the women's side, Rybakina finally in the top 10. Would have been in the top 10 at the end of the year had Wimbledon awarded her points for winning. She is at number 10. As we mentioned previously, Arena is back to number 2. As a Renka up 8 spots to 16, Pliskova 11 spots surging to number 20. Magdalenette, what a tournament. 23, she too cut her ranking in half. 
23 spots up to number 22. Donna Vekic up 31 spots to number 33. Madison Keys. If you recall, she finished the year top 10 last year. She drops 11 spots to 24. Danielle Collins drops 29 places to number 40. Linda Fruvitova, one spot away from the top 50 debut at age 17. And Zhu Lin, who had an incredible tournament, up 33 spots to number 54. We held a fantasy league on the Tennis Live app, TNNS. Thanks for everybody who joined. We've never used this app for fantasy before, so it was a big experiment. And apologies for not advertising this on the show. It was something that was very last minute, and obviously we could have had more people participate, and that's something we will keep in mind going forward uh, yes. for the other slams. We're not going to do this on a week-to-week tennis basis, but for the rest of the slams in 2023, I think we're going to do this. Okay. And we'll and, advertise it better. Yeah. But honestly, we had never used this format before, so it was really like, we didn't know how it was going to work out. And I don't know if we will use this format again. Yeah. But... Uh, I want to congratulate the winners. On the women's side, Sarah's Smashers, with no H, was number one by a mile. Tied for number two, like this is golf. A few people with screen names, I can't tell who you are. They're just like user or whatever. But also tied for number two is Body Serve Hall of Fame hopeful, <laughs> TJC05. <laughs> if you know, you know. Where did you finish? What is this, the woman? Oh, God. On the women's, I didn't do too well. I tied for 28. I tied for 10th in the women's. Okay. That's, we both picked the winner. That's pretty good. We did. Yes, we did. However, let's talk about the men's, which I did. I already told you I didn't care about the men's. However, I did really well in this bracket. Am I seeing right? You are third yes. in the men's? So congratulations to Golden Girl, who won the men's. Mallory Claire is number two, and I am number three. Where am I? Where where are you, sir? <laughs> I see you scrolling, but uh, I... <laughs> it can't have been that bad, could it? Go back. Wow. I am 72nd in the men. Great gowns. Beautiful gowns. We can't all be golden girl. I, you know, I, we're I got, trying. I got one top 10. I'm, I'm okay with that. I didn't come 180th. <laughs> I, was, I was very surprised at how well I did in the men's. Really pleased about that. I picked the finalists. Well, and I picked the winner. Well, that's why. No, I was... I was leading steady in the top three for a while. Okay, but I'm just saying, never mind. <laughs> so we'll we'll try this again, this racket bracket. It always seems like a last minute rush to find a site that's hosting it. I do hope, as I say this in closing, that if you are a Novak fan who is still listening, I mean, I don't want to alienate you totally. Because clearly you find some merit in listening to us. But I just want you to know that these are... Our comments and thoughts on this episode are 100% authentic. Like, it may be unpalatable to listen to, but like... It was a disaster for us <laughs> to live through I mean, this month. I I don't do I don't do this to lie. Like, I'm, I'm just... If I, if I wanted to lie and bullshit... Like, maybe more people would listen. I mean, we for sure did that in the past, but we're too old for that. The, no. Uh, the usual disclaimers, yes, we're biased. Yes, we are absolutely pressed. I'm pressed. I'm so annoyed. And it is what it is. Yeah, if, I mean, if you're a Novak fan and you're still listening after however many minutes, wow. And like, it's, that it, is admirable. It is absolutely nothing to do with Rafa and 22. Like, I, I legit could not care less about that. No. Like number... No, I mean, I anticipate Rafa losing all those records. Like, you know, if come to terms with it, it's fine. Like, this is squarely about uh, how tennis is mirroring regular life and the world we live in right now. That mm -hmm. everybody is so quick and eager to pretend like the last three years have not happened. And when you have something that occurred in a sport that we care about so much and, well, I mean, we cover so extensively and have spent so much time with over the last eight years, to pretend like none of that happened in service of the coronation of that, all that, 
it was it's noxious it will it was too much it was too much to bear honestly i don't say this lightly i've scarcely been more enraged than i was <laughs> by you, something on a tennis court i'm not enraged i'm completely disinterested Oh, I was disgusted. Well, that's where I am. That's I my wa- truth. I didn't watch it, so that's why I'm not <laughs> yeah. enraged. You didn't have to try and go to bed at 7.30 after have dealing with that. But no. That said, yes, yeah, send us your addresses for postcards. Tonal shift here. <laughs> <laughs> the GoFundMe will close sometime this week. Maybe Friday, maybe Sunday. Who knows? And I promise, I promise that we'll be more interested going forward. I was very interested this entire oh, month. I promise that I will be more interested going <laughs> forward. I want you all to get your money's worth, is what I'm saying. I don't know why I'm being lumped into that. I am... <laughs> I said I. I switched I am to the first so person. so sleep deprived. You are. It's... Listen, it's going to take him months to reset to a, like a normal human schedule. And even then, No, it's seriously. Not seriously. Yes. Like to be able to go to bed by 3 a.m. consistently is a struggle would be a victory last year was the worst i've ever experienced yes Yes. it wasn't until like may or june that i could even come close to that you know i told you i told you and the people will hear it now we were recovering from covid i said don't do this shit again you need to protect your health but what is he doing watching novak Djokovic fall into the arms of his parents at 7 30 a.m eastern standard time well, what do you do when you're able to witness Jesus weeping? <laughs> it's a once Stop. in a lifetime moment. Stop. Novak wept. Is that the title? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> we we this is the first time we have like four or five episode titles that we don't have the slightest clue because they're all so good. Well, let's hope other people agree. Let's wrap it up. Thank you for listening to episode two hundred and ninety one. Again, if you've contributed $75 and above, hit us up with your addresses. If you've contributed in the past and you've changed addresses or you're at the same address, we have that on file. Just let us know what to do, right? So we're we're taking cues from you all. And I think we said that we would give a prize for the winners of this Fantasy League thing, didn't we? We definitely tweeted something about that. So if you are... Oh, I believe we discussed it privately. No, we definitely tweeted about it after. We discussed privately and then sent a tweet. Oh, you mean you tweeted. I can't follow all of your tweets. I mean, to be honest, when I wake up in the morning, I'm afraid to check the mentions and notifications oh, of the body God. serve. Uh, I don't read them because I do not need to upset my spirit every morning. That's not to say that you are tweeting wrong things. It's just that I know mm-hmm. what the pushback will be. Anyway. And, and like I, for two years in Arona, we had... You woke up to one particular person in our mentions. Uh, sure, out of pocket. Sure did. Almost Struggling cuss, with reading you know comprehension. What? Almost cussed that person out. But I'm 30-something years old, and I'm better than that now. On occasion. I'm trying. For the most part. Striving. Anyway, if you are Sarah Smashers, or if you are a Golden Girl, let us know. We'll send you something. All right. You can find everything BodyServe related, including the GoFundMe at linktree.com slash thebodyserve. Thank you for coming on this Australian Open tennis journey with us to start season nine of the podcast. My name is Jonathan. You can find me on Twitter at tennis underscore John. And I'm James at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's. See you in February. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.